Okay, so for your um, fourth discussion topic, I've got to admit, admit I'm sort of dancing all over the place. It relates to Hobbes Leviathan, which I think is the most important work of political philosophy or political theory uh, presented from the modern era. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still very much a going concern. Um, and uh, basically, the, the question I'm asking you treads over um, three chapters here, right? Uh, first off, in um, chapter 16, uh, Hobbes defines a person um, on your page 217 as he whose words or actions are considered either as his own or as representing the words of actions of another man or of any other thing to whom they are attributed, whether truly or by fiction. I went over this in the video. Um, so basically, personhood is an act of representation. So for example, when I uh, re speak for my daughters, I am bearing their person. I'm speaking for them. Um, it, when you ask a lawyer to represent you, effectively their arguments are in on being made on your behalf right so effectively when somebody has the authority to represent you they bear your person right um, and interestingly um, that section closes um, by pointing out that a multitude of people are made one when they are by that one person represented, so that it be done, sorry, page 220, so that it be done with the consent of every one of the multitude in particular. For it is the unity, uh, unity of the representer, not the unity of the represented, that maketh the person one. And in, uh, at, well, excuse me, and it is the representer that beareth the person, but and but one person and unity cannot um, otherwise be understood in multitude right so when people are represented by one person that many people are made one person uh, through that act of representation this becomes more interesting on your page 227 um, when Hobbes presents uh, the Commonwealth Agreement, right? Um, it's in italics on 227 towards the bottom there. I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or to this assembly of men on this condition that thou give up thy right to him and authorize all of his actions in like manner. This done, the multitude so united in one person is called, called a commonwealth in Latin civitas. Um, this is the generation of the great Leviathan, or rather, to speak more reverently, of that mortal God to which we owe, under the immortal God, our peace and defense. So, effectively, what this commonwealth agreement is supposed to do is give all of the power and all of the authority to this one person or assembly of people, right, and create sort of a real unity among us through giving that one person the authority to choose and act on our behalf. Now, Hobbes is doing this to overcome a problem, and we've seen this from Hobbes um, all throughout. We can't be trusted. Or at least there is one thing that you can trust a human being to do, and that is act in their own private interest. That's what gets us into the state of war, or state of nature, six of one, half dozen of the other. Right? And that's why we can't trust anybody to lead, because when they've got a choice between doing what's good for them and what's doing good for everyone, they're always going to choose what's good for them. Right? Now, interestingly, right, it becomes quite clear um, in chapter uh, do, 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 do 19, um, I'm skipping over the rights of the sovereign, but the last chapter we're taking a look at, where he goes over the several kinds of commonwealth um, and uh, it basically does a comparative analysis between um, a, a monarchy and um, an aristocracy and a democracy. Right, so, um, and a monarchy actually comes out on top, mainly because 
when power is shared, when there are multiple representatives, you can't trust those representatives to act in the interest of the public good. Why? Because our passions lead us to calculate what's in our own best interest over and above what's in the interest of everybody else. I think contemporary politics has furnished us with enough examples of that uh, to, to make the case quite abundantly clear. All right? So, basically what I'm asking you, and I'll just look at how I put it here. Let me see, where is it? Um, do, 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 do. How does this conceptual move, which is contractually supported, break down the distinction between private interest and the public good? Uh, that's the trick for Hobbes. What he wants to do is break down the distinction between the public good and private interest, at least for this one person. Who's going to be the sovereign? Who can we trust? Well, it doesn't matter the way Hobbes has it laid out, because you can all trust us to do what's in our own private interest. And if there's one person with all the power and all the authority, he's going to do whatever is good for him. And where does all of his power and all of his authority come from? The rest of us. Right? So effectively, what is good for the sovereign is good for the commonwealth and what's good for the commonwealth is good for the sovereign because the wealthier the more prosperous the citizens of the commonwealth the wealthier and more prosperous the sovereign and vice versa right so if this person is any good at calculating what is in their own best interest we can thereby trust them to be the sovereign it's not so when power, Hobbes argues, power has to be shared, right? Because quite frequently, the public good and private interest come into a form of conflict. And this is where we get scandals and corruption and, um, you know, etc. So um, I don't know if you buy that or not. I'm not sure, right? But within the constraints of Hobbes argument, it's at least interesting to argue through. So um, basically what I want you to do is engage with this material and have a discussion on this topic. All right. Have a good ones. One for each of you.